started. Uh, so we've made it to the made it to the end. Uh, so last last week we talked about problems with our picture of the universe with the standard model, um, and this week we'll talk about what a potential solution might be like, and we'll look in detail at some of those solutions and how we actually test them um, at the LHC. Um, okay, so a reminder of the basic problems um, that we talked about last week. So we have these two principles, quantum mechanics and space-time. They've led us to remarkably successful theory, okay? But it, uh, and they can predict essentially everything around us in terms of these fundamental parameters associated with, with length scales in the theory. However, if you ask what those, what those length scales should look like, these basic principles tell us that the picture should be like this. They should all be roughly at the same scale. Um, and in fact, we know that this is not true. Okay, these things being at the same scale is bad um, for a number of reasons. Um, if, the, if the Hubble scale or the size of the universe is at this length scale, then the universe is either incredibly tiny or it's ex exploding, uh, doubling in size incredibly rapidly. Um, and if the weak scale is at this length scale, as we talked about last week, uh, then the, the strength of gravity is much higher and, and all the big structures around us are black holes, so things like atoms and people and planets. Um, so we know that this can't be, can't be the way the picture is, and in fact, we know that it's not, that's not like that. So what we actually observe looks like this. So there are these giant differences between these, these scales. So this is 10 to the 17, so one followed by 17 zeros, separates the Planck scale and the weak scale, and then an even bigger distance scale um, separating these two. Um, and so this is, this is a problem. Uh, the, the, the current theory can account for these big differences by these implausible and just ridiculous calculations or cancellations. So what we say is that there are parameters in the theory that, that you can adjust that, that can, give, can give you a picture that looks like this. Uh, but it's clearly we're missing something deep. Right? And so really the theory is saying that, we, that there's no good reason for why these scales are so big. That's just the way it is. That's the way these parameters happen, happen to be. Um, this is clearly begging for, um, for, for explanation. Okay, and so the thing I want to stress again is that it's these basic principles of quantum mechanics and space-time that were so successful get us into this mess. Okay, and so just naively, if we want to avoid if we want to avoid this picture, it looks like we need either modifications of quantum mechanics or space-time to avoid to avoid this. Uh, okay, and so. Another thing I want, I want to realize, stress last week, and I want to bring up again, is that these problems are not sort of esoteric associated with these scales, but they actually are are important, right? And they're, they're relatively easy to understand. So with each it, with each scale, there's a significant major mystery. So at the Planck scale, we saw that our notion of space time, or or, um, or you know what physics is about, is breaking down. And so the, the, the question is, what you know, how can we replace space time at, at those distant scales? This is often called the problem of quantum gravity that you'll see, you'll see in the literature. Uh, there's a mystery associated with the, the, the weak scale that why it's so far apart from the Planck scale. This is the same question as why is gravity so weak? Okay, and this is also referred to in literature as the hierarchy problem. Um, and then the issue of the why the Hubble scale is so separated from the others is directly related to why is the universe so big? Okay, and this is also called the cosmological constant problem. So these are not small, minor details that, 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 that we're missing. Uh, OK, so today's lecture is about um, how we might go beyond this and extend our, uh, our, our notion of, of the theories. Um, and so what, what comes next, and as we'll see, the Higgs boson is really critical uh, in, in understanding. OK, so the focus, so the, the focus of this lecture is going to be on the problems associated with the weak scale. Okay, and that's, um, for a number of reasons, that's the one that I know the most about. It's the one that the LHC is most applicable for. Um, but, these, but these other, not to say that these other scales, the, the other problems aren't, aren't, as, aren't as basic. Um, and it would be, I think you guys should ask for um, lectures on, on how to solve these <coughs> issues as well. Um, another thing, another issue with the weak scale is it's the most tractable problem, I think, now. Um, so this is the, this is another slide that we looked at last week showing the, where these scales are. So the Planck scale is down here with 10 to the minus, uh, minus 36 meters. Uh, this, is where we've, this is where we've been uh, experimentally. We've probed this, this region. The LHC now is probing the, the weak scale. So it's not only is it the frontier, but it's probing this fundamental scale in nature. 
Um, and, and here, so, uh, so that wheat scale is interesting because it's, it's the place we're currently probing now, but we also understand the physics at this scale incredibly, incredibly well, right? So we have this theory that, that can explain uh, the, the particles and forces of nature very well at this, at this scale. Okay, so, so a reminder of, the, of the, the problems associated with the wheat scale. Um, we put them in, sort of gave two examples of this last week. One of them was in terms of the, the Higgs boson mass itself. Um, and so if you look at what, what the, these vacuum fluctuations would do to the Higgs mass, you would have diagrams that look like this, where you have a top, uh, top quark uh, in, this, in this correction. And this goes like a cutoff scale in the theory, which naively would be the, something like the Planck scale. And that would give a ridiculous, uh, you know, a very large contribution to the, the Higgs mass. So that would be something like 10 to the, 10 to the 20 GeV. Uh, and we solve this by this fine tuning, as I, as I said. So we, what we say is that, that, this, that this diagram actually does give a number that's, that, that goes like the, the, the Planck scale squared. But there happens to be another term, another piece of this, of this mass, so the, the, the bare mass that corrects this to 30 digits. And that, that was obviously missing something basic there. OK, so one thing I want to stress here is that, that we now, these problems are very different in nature than the other problems that we've had in the standard model before. Uh, so these problems are known as naturalness problems. Okay? And so they're, they're really qualitatively different. So the theory that we have now is, is fully logically consistent. Okay? Um, the, the, the problem is really that we have these, and we need these very bizarre or unnatural choice of input parameters. So we need to, to have these very fine-tuning, uh, fine-tuned parameters in place. But, it, but, it, but once you do that, the theory is, is, is logically consistent. So it's really unlike the situation that we've had before that we talked about uh, with the need for the Higgs. So there, um, the theory without the Higgs was really logically inconsistent. You had, you had this scattering of W bosons that gave probabilities that were bigger than one. And you couldn't put mass into the theory in a consistent way. So we're not, it's, it's really a, a different flavor of, of, of problem. OK, this is, a, again, it's, an, it's a, another slide from, from last week. But just to remind you, uh, we can estimate sort of what, at what scale do we expect the modification in our theory in order to solve this problem. Um, and here's the, this is the Higgs mass that we've now measured. Um, as we all know, this is roughly at the weak scale. Um, and this, it, it, in the, with the current theory, this has, this has a number of pieces. This is, it has this, this input parameter piece. This is what we call sometimes the classical mass, the Higgs. So this is our input parameter. And then we have these corrections, okay? And these corrections that go like the cutoff, <laughs> cutoff squared. Um, and so, uh, so if, if we want to avoid fine tuning, right? So if we don't, if we don't want to rely on these numbers to be closely related, we need this cutoff scale to be roughly at the weak scale, right? So it's, it's you know, naively this is the Planck scale, but it doesn't help if it's half the Planck scale or a third of the Planck scale, because then there would be, we would also need very big fine tuning. So let's say if it was 10% the Planck scale, we would need these numbers to agree to 10 decimal places or something. So it's, it's, it's not enough that, um, that this cutoff scale is, is not the Planck scale. It really has to be at the weak scale in order to avoid this, this fine tuning. Okay, and that's what we said last week. So um, we expect contributions. So in order for this cutoff to be at the weak scale, we would expect something that looks like this. So we, another diagram uh, that contributes to this to this Higgs Higgs boson mass, uh, where this new particle has a mass that's roughly the weak scale, so roughly about a, a, a TeV. Um, and in this pencil metaphor, where the pencil is standing on its on the tip uh, of the table. Um, this is this is the this is analogous to the pencil or the string that's that's keeping the pencil pencil in stable stable state. So this is what we expect, and it's roughly at this scale that we expect that we expect corrections. Okay, so now these naturalness problems. There's actually a history of them um, in, in physics. Um, there's many examples where the where this logic of, of fine tuning. Uh, was needed. The same arguments of what scale should the new physics arise were made, and they were exactly correct. Okay, and so I'll just go over one of those here. Um, and so this example uh, comes from the energy stored in the electric field around an electron. Okay, so if you have an electron sitting here, this is classically um, there's uh, there's electric field lines coming from this electron, 
Um, and you can ask how much, and so these, this electric field stores energy, and you can ask how much energy is stored in the electric field. Um, and that's given by this, by this here. So it goes like this alpha the, the, that we talked about times the distance from the electron. So if you, let's say, you add up the energy from infinity going closer and closer to the electron, um, it gets, it's this equation. And so the closer that you get to the electron, it looks like the more energy is stored in this field. Uh, so naively, this seems infinite. At the time, you know, the electron was thought to be a point particle. It's, a, it's still thought to be a point particle in our theory, but, but that was true with the classical, classical world as well. So naively, this th seems, to be, uh, seems to be infinite. Um, now, if you think about it, this, this energy is actually associated with an electron that's not moving. It's just sitting there. It has, this, it has an electric field, and that electric field has energy. So a clever solution is saying that, well, this energy is actually uh, related to the rest energy of the electron or its mass. Right? And so you can say that the electron mass comes from the energy that's stored within the electric field. Uh, and if that's, but of course, we know that this is finite, right? that the electron mass is, is finite. So what you could do is you could say, well, this calculation is true, but there's a cutoff. Right? So just, just as we have um, in the problem with the Higgs, you could say that there's this cutoff where this where this physics is correct until you get to a certain di distance from the electron, and then it starts breaking down. Right? So you can think that maybe the electron isn't a point particle, but has some size. So it's like a sort of a sphere that, that, um, that has some fundamental size that cuts off this calculation. Okay? And so what you could, what you could that, and this is, this is what was done at the time, so you could, you could introduce this, this cutoff or this finite size to the electron, and you can estimate it at what scale, you know, what size does the electron need to be, uh, or what size does the, the physics, does this calculation need to break down at in order to get, in order to make sense of this in terms of the electron mass. Um, and if you think about it, this, so if, if, you, if you equate this energy with the electron mass, then this scale needs to be roughly um, alpha over the mass of the electron. Right, so that's true right here. Of course, you could also say, well, the electron is much smaller than this, and you just have this fine tuning between what the electron mass is and what the energy of, and the mass in the electromagnetic field is. But if you want to avoid that fine tuning, this scale needs to be given by alpha over the electron, electron mass. OK, so again, this is just an, this is analogous to the naturalness arguments that, that we're using for the Higgs. Um, and it requires new physics or a different description of what's, what's going on in this, this picture to kick in at a, at a, at a distance scale that's, that's alpha over me. Um, or just another way of saying it, is our picture of just this point-like electron must break down at this scale. Okay, and of course, as we know, this is exactly what happens, right? And so, in fact, in a much earlier scale, uh, 100 times earlier, you start seeing this cloud of, cloud of antiparticles, right? So if, 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 you, right, if you go in towards the electrons we saw, you, you have these, you start seeing these vacuum fluctuations of electrons and anti-electrons, and this actually kicks in at one over the mass of the electron, so 100 times or one over alpha times sooner. So the, the exact same logic that we're using uh, in the case of Higgs mass applies here, and it gives the correct answer. Okay? And that in this answer, it's a dramatic answer, right? It's the solution is antiparticles, really an extension of what we think empty space or what empty space was thought to be, um, extension of space time by adding adding quantum mechanics, and this doubles the number of particles in the theory, right? So that's that's sort of what, what the solution took um, for this problem. Okay, and I should say, say there's, there's other analogies that are very um, that are very similar to this uh, as well. Okay, so now let's talk about uh, let's talk about back back to the problem associated with the weak scale. Um, so again, the, the issue is the, the vacuum fluctuations predicts the Planck scale to be uh, the same as the weak scale, and we observe this. Okay, so what what can what sort of potential solutions can there be? And there's really been three ways to get out of this, this issue. Um, but we expect these, these solutions, just like the case of the, the electron, to be dramatic. Right? This is a basic pe feature of space-time that gets us into this. Um, and we expect big, uh, big changes. Um, and so there were really three, there's really been three ideas that have, that, that have shown to work. I'll just go through those quickly. The first is something that's called compositeness. Okay? Basically, the idea here is that um, this isn't a problem because the weak scale isn't really fundamental. 
Okay, the weak scale sort of is, doesn't, doesn't exist fundamentally. Um, and the idea behind that is that the Higgs isn't a fundamental particle, but it's made of smaller things. Okay, it's made of some other, um, other particles, and that means this weak force is not fundamental. So this is similar to like the size of the proton, right? The, the proton size isn't a fundamental thing in the, in the theory. It's sort of an accidental scale from the, that's given by the strong force. Um, and so maybe the same thing is happening with the Higgs. Uh, and if, if this is the case, this new, you have to have new forces, new matter, so really a big extension of what, of what we know. And it's, and it's the result of this, this new force and this new matter that's responsible for both the Higgs boson and the, the shape of this Higgs potential. Right, so this funny shape with a, with a minimum that's displaced from zero. And it could be this, just these, these accidental interactions of this new, new force and new matter that sets this weak scale. Okay, so that's one, one sort of uh, solution that, is that this scale doesn't, doesn't really exist. Um, this, a second type of solution is extra dimensions. Okay, so there are uh, additional dimensions of, of, of space that, that we can't see because they're, they're much smaller than the large distances that we know about. Um, and, and this solution is basically saying that really the Planck scale is at the weak scale. So we really are in this situation. Um, and it looks like the Planck scale is so much farther away because of these extra dimensions. Okay? And the idea there, I'm not going to go into this in detail, um, but the idea here is that gravity appears weak because these, these gravitons can, the, the strength can propagate in this extra dimension and they can be, they can be diminished. So, but really, the solution is that um, that this is the this is the state of uh, of the world. It just looks like this because of these extra dimensions. So they mask this uh, this underlying reality. Okay. Then there's an even deeper, uh, or the, there's the third uh, the third potential solution that's referred to as supersymmetry. Okay. And basically, this idea is that this notion of vacuum fluctuations. Okay. So that. We saw in the, in, the, um, in the last lecture that the vacuum fluctuations are critical for understanding quantitatively uh, aspects of the theory, making predictions about which particles should exist. Um, and so we know that we know that they're that they're true, uh, but but we only know that above the weak scale. Okay, and so in, in a sense, what, what the supersymmetry idea is is that the vacuum fluctuations are, are correct and they're exactly as we expect to the weak scale, but then they stop. They stop acting below the weak scale. Uh, and so, super, so I'll go through an example of how supersymmetry works um, in, in, in some detail on the next slides. This is really, the, I think, the deepest, the deepest solution to this problem. Uh, and it's, it's really been a favorite within the field. Um, so I wouldn't want to go through this. OK, so, so there's many different ways to talk about supersymmetry. The way I'll talk about it uh, is, is really as a modification of, of, of space time. Um, so, so here's our familiar four-dimensional space-time, okay, with, you know, you have electrons and other things that are propagating. Uh, and in supersymmetry, the idea is that you add an extra dimension, okay, so it's similar to the other solution, except this extra dimension is quantum mechanical in nature. You can think of it as quantum mechanical, and I'll talk about what that means uh, in the next slides. Um, and so the idea is you can, have, you can also have particles that propagate in, this, in these quantum extra dimensions, and these are like, we call them super partners to the, the particles in our regular, our familiar four dimensions. So if you have an electron that's propagating also in this quantum dimension, uh, it's called a super electron. Okay, and so the idea here is that, of course, in our familiar four dimensional space time, uh, we measure distances in just normal numbers, okay, numbers that everyone's familiar with. Um, and in particular, if you, if you exchange the numbers or if you do x times y, that's equal to y times x. So, uh, fairly uncontroversial. However, what's special about these, and what makes these extra dimensions quantum mechanical, is that they're measured in sort of quantum numbers. These are numbers that, that arise in, in quantum mechanics. Um, and they have the property that if you flip the, if you, if you take a product and flip it, so instead of x times y, that's equal to, instead of y times x, that's equal to negative y times x. Okay, um, and it might seem innocuous at first, but if, if, there, if you have two x's, right, so if x times x is equal to minus x times x, that means x squared is equal to zero. Okay? And so there's a sense in which you can only take one step in this extra dimension. Right? If you take two, two steps, you get, you get zero. Okay, so it's interesting that this doubles uh, the number of particles in the theory. Right? You, have the, this, you have the standard model particles, things that propagate in our familiar 
uh, four dimensional space time, but you also have their super partners. Okay, so these are these particles propagating with one step in this extra dimension. So it's very similar also to the solution of the, the problem associated with the electromagnetic or the electric field of the from the electron having to double double the particles in the world. Um, okay, and then all but all the all the regular rules of quantum field theory that we talked about and all these stick figures and how they how particles interact and forces are the same. So it's it's really a regular theory with this with this added uh, added extra dimension. Um, and so that's the super part. There's also why it's called supersymmetry is there's a symmetry relating the particles that are in these that propagate these super particles to the to the part to the regular particles that we know about. Okay. So so um, for instance, the forces that they that they experience are the same, and they have the same. Uh, they have the same coupling, or the same strength of the, the interaction. Okay, so we haven't seen these superpartners, right? Uh, so there's there's nothing that looks like uh, looks like an electron um, propagating the section dimension that we've seen. Um, but this could be another example, and we think that this is, is another is probably another example of a long distance illusion, right? So we saw in the in, in the third lecture. That we have these four forces in nature that seem to us very different, right? We have electromagnetism, the weak interaction, strong interaction, um, and they look very different to us. But actually, if you probe them on small scales, they're described in the exact same language, and they even have similar interaction strengths. So going to smaller distance scales shows that they're that they're really the same, and the fact that they look different is really a long distance illusion, and that could also be the same for for supersymmetry. Okay. And just and so the idea here is that there is this supersymmetry, but it's only apparent when you go to smaller distance scales. <coughs> um, and by our, by our uh, the arguments of when we expect new physics to kick in, we expect the supersymmetry to start being apparent or start being relevant at the TeV scale, right? Just just based on the naturalness, the natural star argument. Um, and so the idea is that if we start going to short enough distances, we will start seeing the supersymmetry directly. Um, Okay, yeah, that's what I said. So how does this actually help? So that's what, that's what the theory predicts, but how does this solve the problem that we have? Um, so this is the problem again, we have this thing at the weak scale, it's a sum of two, uh, in, in the current theory, this is the sum of two um, and more uh, diagrams. This diagram goes with the cutoff squared. Um, and so what supersymmetry says is, well, there's another diagram that you should be considering, not just this, this correction with the, the, the particle in the loop, but there's another the diagram that looks like this, where this is the super part. This is the super partner of the, or the super particle in the loop. Okay, and if you if you put these two together, there's actually a cancellation that happens, and this the sum of these two is exactly at the weak scale. Okay, so this 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 shows you that now 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 these these two terms don't have to cancel for this very high precision. Uh, another way of thinking it, so this is, you know, last week we also talked about this problem in terms of the Higgs field, not the Higgs boson. And so the idea there was you had some fluctuations that were, that were fluctuating that would make the masses higher. And those, those fluctuations got larger at small distances. And the way to think about the solution in, in those terms is that once you, once you get to the scale where the supersymmetry becomes apparent, so this, you have this other, these particles propagate this other dimension, they can only take one step. So they can't really fluctuate wildly in this other dimension. And so you have these, you know, our, the logic that we had about the, the vacuum fluctuations was exactly correct that we, that we walked through last, last time. The, the energy density gets bigger and bigger and bigger until you get down to the weak scale, or the, super, the scale of supersymmetry, which is the weak scale. Then these fluctuations cancel. Okay? And then from, from there on, there's no, um, you can't fluctuate because there's a symmetry and the particles cannot be fluctuating in this extra dimension. Okay, so this is something that we can test at the LHC. Um, here's sort of an example of how you would do that. If, if, if you're, we're colliding these things at the, squip, the scale where supersymmetry um, becomes relevant, you can, these proton collisions can produce things like super tops, okay? Um, so top quarks propagating in these extra dimensions. And we can look for this effect, um, look this effect in collisions. Um, so it gives diagrams that look that look like this. Um, so you produce these super tops. They're actually very short, 
shortly lived, so they decay to other, other particles, and in particular they decay to a, a regular top quarks, something that we know about, um, and something that's basically a super photon. Okay, so a uh, partner, you know, the, the, the photon that's propagating in the section dimension. And now it turns out that the super photon, just from the details of the theory, how, what sort of stick figures you can, you can draw, and the fact that this is the, the super photon tends to be the lightest of the, the super particles, that this is stable. Okay, so it can't, it's protected from decaying to other, to other particles. And so this would show up uh, in our detector, we talk about as a neutrino. Okay, so we would see that as a momentum imbalance. So now you can think about the super photon uh, a little bit. Um, it turns out that it's massive, so it has a mass that's you know, roughly the weak, the weak scale where, this, where, the, where these quantum mechanical dimensions start becoming important. Um, as I said, it's stable because it's the lightest and it's protected by, uh, from decaying to other particles. Um, and it's relatively weakly interactive. Okay, so it, 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 again, it interacts with, at the scale of the, uh, at the weak scale. Um, and so, so these types of diagrams also happen early in the universe. Okay, so you know, during the, after the Big Bang, you would have this. Um, and they would survive out to today. And so this is actually a perfect candidate for what we can make up the dark matter. Right? And so you can see this is something that, that sort of comes out of this, this idea of supersymmetry that, that was not put in directly. Right? We really wanted it to solve this mystery of the, why the Higgs mass is so light, what solves the, this hierarchy problem. Um, and, and a solution to that problem gives a uh, perfect candidate for this other problem that we also thought was needed at roughly this scale. Um, and and here's, how, here's how we see that. Okay, so that's one of the reasons why we're so excited about, uh, about this, this explanation of the problem. And I'll go over another reason as well. Um, so again, we talked about these stick figure diagrams that are responsible for the interactions. And um, as, I, as I just said, the, looks like these all have the same sort of formalism or the same language to describe the forces. Um, and not only that, they actually have similar values, right? So this alpha that we talked about is sort of 1 over 100. The, the, the number for the weak force is 1 over 50. Um, and the strong force is about 1 over 10. So not only is it the same, the sort of, same sort of mathematics behind it, but also similar uh, force with similar values. So you might start entertaining the idea that maybe these are all related to each other. Right, maybe they, they come from a common thing. Um, and we also talked about the fact that these interaction strengths vary with distance, right, with scale. So when, if, you measure, if you want to measure the force of the electron, you go to, as you go to smaller scales, you start seeing these vacuum fluctuations, and that modifies the effective coupling that you would measure. And we saw the same thing with the, with the strong force. Right, and that's what gives us the size of the proton. Um, and so you can plot the, what, these, what these look like, so the, with the strengths of these, um, how, how they change with scale and with energy here. And that's what's shown here. Um, and so it's interesting that they're, you know, the, as I said, they're not so dissimilar, and they actually get closer as you go to higher energy or smaller scales. Um, but they don't quite meet, right? So there's not, if they, if they really came together, you might really start entertaining the fact that they're from the same, ultimately from the same force in some way. But in the standard model, they, they, there's a near miss, right? It doesn't quite work. However, in ideas with, with supersymmetry, so an, ex, an extension of the standard model that has supersymmetry, they actually do meet at a point. It's a very high precision. I think it's a precision of 1%. Right? And so this is actually um, another thing that was not put in by hand. Okay? And so this is, I think this is also quite, quite amazing. Right? This definitely did not have to happen. We didn't, you know, we don't make the theory do this. Um, of course, it could be just a coincidence that this happens. Um, but it seems to me like this is a strong sign that this idea is on the right track. And you have these, you know, two of these pieces come out um, sort of for free by solving this other problem associated with, with the Higgs mass. OK, so that's sort of a flavor of what one of the solutions might look like. The, others, the other solutions are, are similar, um, although they're, they're really not as deep as the, as the supersymmetry. Uh, so how can we actually look for these solutions um, at the LHC? So that's what the rest of the uh, lecture will be about. Um, and so really for this, the, the Higgs boson is, is, is critical for this, for this program. Okay? So of course, the, the problem associated with weak scales ultimately with, with associated, associated with the Higgs field. 
Um, and so that means that the, uh, the problem is, is um, uh, uh, sorry, the Higgs boson is a harbinger of the Higgs field, so it's how we can probe the Higgs field, how we can understand it's there. Um, and because of that, it's really critical for all the, the solutions that are related to the Higgs, the problems related to the Higgs field itself. So, and I'll just go through how the connection for the three potential solutions. So for this compositeness idea, um, it's really that there's a deeper origin for this, this potential that we talked about. Okay, and so in order to understand this potential and really measure it in detail, as we'll talk about later, we could do this, uh, we, could, we could do this experimentally with, with events that have pairs of Higgs bosons, or two, two Higgs bosons um, in an event. Uh, ideas of extra dimensions, or the solutions that have extra dimensions give excited gravitons, so these are, they look to us as heavier particles in the theory. These particles can decay directly to pairs of Higgs bosons, so they have a, uh, a coupling to the Higgs, Higgs particle. So we can also look for this, we can look at events that have this, uh, this final state. Um, and then as we saw with supersymmetry, um, in order to solve this problem, there has to be a new, some new particle that, that contributes to this correction to the, to, the, to the Higgs mass. So really all these potential solutions at the weak scale have this direct relationship to the Higgs, to the Higgs boson. So I'll just go through quickly examples of, of how we might test for these in the, rest of the, uh, in the rest of the lecture. But one thing I want to point out here is really this is what the Higgs boson is good for. Okay, this is another, you know, we gave other answers what the Higgs is good for before, but this is really a deeper, deeper level answer, and this is really what, why we're so excited about it within the field, the Higgs boson. So by studying how we produce and, and the Higgs boson decays, we can really address these fundamental questions of why is gravity so weak. Okay, so this is not, it's, it's not a boring technical detail. It's critical to, to, um, to basically all the structure around it. So we saw that, the, you know, the scales of planets, life, etc. it's all due to the, the weakness of gravity, and this is how we can test uh, which, if one of these potential solutions is responsible for why gravity is so weak. Okay, so again, I'll quickly go through, uh, go through this for the, the three different potential solutions. Um, so starting first with the, with the extra dimension case, so in, in this, as I said, in this, in this scenario you have some, some um, excited gravitons that appear to appear as heavy particles in the theory. Uh, these can then decay to pairs of Higgs bosons. Okay, and as we now all know, the Higgs couples according to mass. So one of the, uh, the, the most pro common way for this, uh, for the Higgs to the case is the pairs of peak quarks. So what we can do here is we can look for, we can look for pictures, of, the pictures that we take with the detectors that look like this. So they have four jets uh, in the event, and each of these jets has a displacement from the interaction point. So this, as we saw in the fourth lecture, was the signature of a P there being a peak quark in the event. Um, and so the idea is that we, that we select pictures that look like this, and then we can sort of reconstruct what might have happened in the event by working backwards. Okay, so we start with um, the observed uh, B jets that are in the event or B quarks in the event, and from those we can pair them to make two Higgs bosons. You calculate the energy associated with each of those Higgs bosons. Then we can combine those again um, to get the properties of potential graviton that was that was present. Okay, so then basically the idea is that that we that we work backwards and then we study what the reconstructed graviton mass uh, is. And so here's an example of this. Um, so what this plot shows is what's what's the mass of the what mass of what we think the graviton would be. Um, and you can see uh, these these colored lines. So like this this shows the distribution uh, of events that you would see if there was a graviton. So you'd have this, you'd have a peak in this distribution, sort of similar to how we discovered the Higgs with a peak in the photon mass. Um, and here's a graviton at a, heavy, a heavier mass would give, give a broader peak. Um, and then you can see in these, in the, in the black dots as our data. So that's the, that's how many pictures that we see at these given masses. And then the, the yellow and the light blue are, is the background. So this is what standard model processes that are not from the graviton look like. Um, and so assigning a graviton would be an excess of data over, over what we expect in the yellow and the light. And so we can see, and what's, what's shown in the bottom is the ratio between the two of these. Um, here we see that there's no, 
no sign of an excess, so no sign of extra dimensions here, but this is, some, this is an example of a uh, distribution that would be sensitive to that. And you can see here we're probing scales that are you know, already a TEV, uh, where we expect this, this 90 to come in. Okay, so that was an example uh, looking for, for extra dimensions at the LHC. Um, and I'll talk now about looking for some of the ways we can look for contributions that correct the Higgs mass like this. Um, so again, we expect very naively corrections like this from that are at roughly the TEV scale. We get that from supersymmetry. There's also other theories that, that give this. Um, and so if we have the, if we have a picture, if we have a diagram that looks like this, and this whatever is this whatever this new particle is, if it interacts electromagnetically or if it, if it experiences the, the electromagnetic force, you can also draw a diagram that looks like this. So we connect into the Higgs. And if it's, if it's charged, there's a coupling between the photons that you can, that you can draw like this. And so this would mod modify the rate at which the Higgs boson would decay to photons. Right? So remember we talked about how often, the theory predicts how often the, the Higgs decays in different ways. And you get that by adding up contributions from different diagrams. And if you have a solution like this, that, where this new, new physics is charged, you would modify that by a diagram that looks like that. Uh, similarly, if this new physics experiences the strong force, okay, then you can attach gluons. So there's a couple would be a coupling for this new, new part of the gluons. And this would modify the rate at which the Higgs bosons are produced at the LHC. So remember, the main way we produced the Higgs bosons was from diagrams that sort of look like this going the other way, where you, we had gluons that go through a top loop to make a Higgs. Uh, a new, new particle in this loop would, would modify that probability. Okay, so it either enhance or suppress that the rate at which we produce these at the LHC. So that's why I made such a big deal out of these, these types of uh, plots in, in, in the, the fifth lecture, right? So what, what, what this shows is our data, so what we've actually <coughs> measured, and, and what we do is we, we put in these, these kappa factors, right? So we say that we allow this coupling, the effective coupling between gluons and the Higgs to change. Um, and we say that this is one in the standard model, but if there's new particles here, that, that could be either bigger than one or less than one, depending on the details um, of the particle mass and coupling, et cetera. And then similarly, you can modify this, the, the Higgs decay to photons. Um, and this is one of the plots that, that we looked at um, before. And so you can see that this is directly te testing this idea. If this new, if these, this new particle is charged uh, under the strong or the electromagnetic interactions, you expect modifications here. And what we see now is very consistent with, with more. Okay, of course, you've seen all these, these details before. Um, okay, so, th so that's how, that's why me measuring the, the properties of the, the Higgs production of decay are so important, because you're really putting constraints on what potential particles can be, can be in this loop. Um, now, of course, we can always play the devil's advocate, right? We can say, well, I'll put in new particles that fix our problem, but I'll just dictate that these that these new particles do not feel the strong or electromagnetic force. So that way I can solve the problem and I can evade these constraints that we have um, from, the, from the measurements that we've been making of the Higgs, Higgs properties. However, there's one thing that you can't avoid. Right? So if you have this interaction, then by construction, you can't avoid an interaction that looks like this, right? where you add uh, another Higgs, Higgs to this um, diagram. Okay? Because, of course, this assumes that you have a Higgs interaction. That's the whole point of it. Um, and so this, this will always be there, and this modifies this di Higgs, di Higgs production, the rate at which we produce pairs of Higgs bosons um, at the LHC. So I talked before about how this was, you know, this di Higgs was really, was really important. Here you see directly why this is so important. Di, di Higgs is important because it's testing this, you know, what could possibly be in this loop in a way that's not susceptible to a devil's advocate, um, you know, removing, removing, um, Way you can shrink. Okay, and then the third, the third piece was this idea of compositeness or things that can modify this this potential that we that we talked about. Um, right, and so this is the this is the this is the Higgs potential. It has this displacement from zero. We said that this was just an input from the theory, right? This is something that we just say um, that this the Higgs field has this form, and this is really where the weak scale is coming from. At this minimum is roughly at the weak scale. Um, and the way that this is done in the, in the theory, the parameters that we, that we put in to, to give it this shape, well, there's really two of them. We say that 
there, there are two pieces. There's the, the, this phi is like the Higgs field. Um, so there's there's a piece that goes like phi squared that has some number that's an input to the theory that is negative. Okay, and this this piece um, to this piece you add another piece that goes like the Higgs field to the fourth, and associated with that is another input parameter lambda. Okay, so it's really these two parameters uh, that we input, and we have a relative sign between these two. Okay, so the idea is that if you're at, so this is the zero if you remember. If we're at small Higgs values, it's this term that dominates. Um, and it's negative, so it goes it goes negative, and then at high field values, this term that has the opposite sign dominates, and it comes back up to be positive. So that's how we get, you know, in, in more detail, that's how we get this this place minimum in the theory. Um, so now, of course, we're, our universe is sitting here, so we have to expand about this this minimum, not zero. Um, and by doing that, um, you can make this substitution into this basic input of phi goes to this this V, which is the, the Higgs condensate, plus the H, which is the Higgs boson. So if you do that, you get you get a number of terms. So it's just this simple substitution above. Um, and I won't go through this in so much detail. But basically, the idea is, doing this, you have one piece that comes out that goes like H cubed. Okay? And that gives you a piece and, and that, that predicts diagrams that look like uh, what we call three-point diagrams, or three Higgs meeting at a point. Right, this type of diagram is because the Higgs is a boson. There's three bosons. That's consistent with our with our basic theory. And there's also a piece that goes like H to the fourth, where you have four uh, Higgs bosons meeting at four Higgs bosons meeting at a point. That this could lift it, this could lead to triple Higgs production. Um, and so the, the basic idea here is that it's the, this shape, this this form of this potential, that predicts which that, that this the interaction strength of this diagram, right? So this, you know, this interaction strength here is given by this lambda three H's. If you assume this form, it has a particular value in the standard model. And so by measuring this probability, by measuring how often this this process happens, we can test what this input form is of the of the theory. Okay. So measure, measuring this di Higgs production is important because it, it allows us to probe the probe the shape of this potential if it's modified by <coughs> different theories of compositeness, for instance, we will get a different value here. Um, so this is another reason why di Higgs production is very important in the standard model, uh, is because it allows us to measure this, measure this, uh, measure this shape. Yeah, that's why I see. Okay, so, so seeing di, di Higgs is really important to the story. So how do we measure di Higgs? So this is another plot that we looked at before. This shows the, in cross sections where the probability for various different processes to happen uh, in, at the LHC. Uh, and so di Higgs is buried under, under all of these. Okay, so, um, and sort of more normal units than these funny barn uh, units that we talked about. You produce pairs of Higgs bosons, assuming just, just the standard model, at about four per hour. Okay, so maybe it doesn't seem so bad, right? We're running for you know, substantial parts of the year. Uh, however, if you look at it, we produce uh, W bosons okay, at four kilohertz. Right? So way much, you know, much, much higher than we're producing dynamics. These, of course, lead to give, give events that have leptons, significant missing energy, um, and, and it gets worse. So you get pop quarks that now these have B jets that can, you know, that are the same as the same objects as that we have in, in Higgs decays. We're producing these ten times per second, um, and even Standard model, even one single Higgs production, these we produce, we're producing, as we, we went over as an event per second, right? So that's a thousand times more than we're producing Paris Higgs. So it's really hard to study, it's really important to study di Higgs production, but it's very hard to study because of this basic idea that they're, um, that it's so rare uh, in the standard model. And so in order to do this, we really need much more data than we currently have in order to really test this, these ideas. Okay, so, so I'll just end um, by talking about what we might know in, in the future. So first, what we might know by sort of 2035 or so. Uh, so here's, the here's a schedule for the future program at the LHC. Um, so here's where we are now. Uh, there's roughly three running periods. There's what we call uh, run one. Okay, so this is the running period that got us the Higgs book, the discovery of the Higgs boson. This was a this lower energy of 8 TeV. 
We're now in the middle of the second, the second period of, that has run two and run three. Uh, this this incre increased the energy to 13 TeV, as we talked about. That's very important for probing high particles with high mass, like the graviton, or like the excited graviton. Um, one of the problems with going to this in, in this, or one of the challenges in this running period, is that, that the number of interactions that are happening at the same time per, per picture is increasing. So we saw you know, examples of that, that we needed 20 interactions per proton collision or per beam crossing to find the Higgs in, in run one. Um, this number is, will go up to about 75 interactions per crossing um, in this running period. Okay? But the advantage of doing this is you can take more data. So we're increasing the data set by about a factor 15 um, in this period. Then there's, a, then there's a, another period that will happen um, around you know, 2026. Here the number of interactions will increase to 150 or 200. So you know, even higher, this is, will really be a major challenge for the triggering, you know, deciding which events to save, and also just filtering out uh, the additional noise that these other interactions give. But this will increase the data set by another factor of 10, okay, so 150 times what, what we have in, in real one. Okay, so this is, this is where we're going. Um, but, but here are these here are these pictures. So this is the one we looked at before, where we have 25 of these interactions giving us uh, giving us background noise, um, and this is where we're going. So we it will have 200 interactions. So this is a really major challenge, both in terms of the triggering, deciding again which events to save, and just in processing these these images and, and making sense out of what's happening. Okay, so I'll just end with some some projections. Um, of where we might be. So what you see here is uh, another representation of the uncertainties on the Higgs production. Okay, so what's shown here is the uncertainty on this mu number that we looked at. Um, this is basically the probability to produce the Higgs um, and have it decay in certain ways. And so we saw that we have these three channels that we measure fairly accurately. The WW, the two photons, and ZZ, those are measured sort of at 20, 30% level. Um, but then we have these rarer channels that are sort of just coming, uh, coming to sensitivity now. And we also went over how we could constrain the Higgs decaying to additional particles that, are, that, that we don't know about. Okay, so this is where we are sort of at, at, at the, with this first running period. Um, here's a projection of where we might be after uh, the, the second running period, run two and three. So you can see that we're, we, we really improved some of these, right? So the, our precision of, of the the photons, W, and the Z, those increase you know, by about a factor two. But these, hard, these things that are harder you know, increase much more significantly. So we go from like 60% measurement of the Bs down to you know, similar to the other precision measurements. OK, and then by run four, this is the, this is the situation we'll be in. So again, further improvement of these, um, and these even rarer modes start becoming uh, more sensitive. Okay, so uh, this is again is something that we talked about. We, we, we put, put all of these uh, measurements in terms of these coupling modifiers. Um, and so we have coupling modifiers for the gluons, so this could represent new particles in this, in this loop. Um, we have a kappa gamma that could represent particles in this decay. And then we, we allow for other modification, modifications of these. You know, so the Higgs decaying to, to Zs or Ws, those couplings could be modified. And we also put in parameters for the fermion couplings. Okay, so in, in this language, um, <laughs> transferring our measurements in, in, into this, uh, you see the results here. Um, so this is now after uh, run two and three, we, we, we have uncertainties in percentages of these parameters that are sort of like, you know, 5%, maybe a little worse. Um, at run, with a, with a full LHC data set, this improves slightly. Okay, so again, some of these are, are more than others. But now you can ask, um, and so this is one of the big reasons for the, the extended LHC running period. Right? So we're, we're able to increase the, the sensitivity on these guys to probe more sharply what's, what could potentially be going happening in the, in the, the Higgs, uh, these corrections to the Higgs mass. Now you can ask, um, what sort of corrections do we expect in some models? So don't worry about these names. Um, but but the, so these are um, potential solutions to the to the, you know, the specific examples of the solutions that we talked about. Um, they have technical names, but these predict um, 
they predict what coupling modifiers you should see. Okay? And the, the, the predictions of these are sort of percent level uh, for modifying W and the Z. And uh, you know, the, uh, variation by the spy is maybe 10% for modifying the decay of the photon. So, but if we're looking for a 10% deviation, we need to measure it in order to get confidence that, that that's actually present. You need to measure it better than, better than 10%. So if you want sort of a, a two sigma confidence level, you need to measure that at 5%. If you want a 5% confidence level, you need to measure that at 2%. So really, you know, the LHC is great for probing what's happening, but if, it's, if some of these models are responsible for what's protecting the Higgs mass, even the sensitivity of the LHC isn't, isn't enough. And we won't be able to have fit it evidence that this is happening. Okay, so, so similarly, we can, we can look directly for these, um, these super partners. So the, the important one is the, is the super partner to the top, to the top quark, the diagram that looks like um, the one that we looked at before. Um, and so another way you can search for supersymmetry is directly looking for these for events like this. Okay, and that's, that's been done. This is a big part of the, the physics program um, at Atlas. And you can see our results here. So this is showing um, the region that's excluded in, in the plane of where you have, this is the mass of the super top, and this is the mass of the super photon. Uh, and this is the region that's excluded. So it's, um, it's this, this shaded, this is, from, this is from the first running period from run, from the run one. The second running period, we expect to extend this um, out to here here. Okay, so now we're starting to cover this interesting TEV, TV scale um, where we expect this new physics to come in. And then by run three or when we increase it by another factor of 10, we expect these dotted lines. So again, big, big increase um, in sensitivity for, for the supersymmetry searches. Uh, okay, so that's, that's sort of what we expect um, from the LHC. And we saw in many ways it's it, you know, we take what we can get, but we don't think it's enough, especially for the Higgs couplings. Um, so now I'll talk about, we'll really end with what we might know about 2055, so now even longer time scales. Um, and so people now are, are really trying to understand what do we do next after the LHC. Um, and so there's proposals for even bigger circles. Okay, so this is the, here you see the LHC, all right, so this is the 27 kilometer ring. Um, of Geneva, there's, a, there's talk about building an even bigger one, so call it FCC, and that would be a 100 kilometer tunnel. Okay. It actually goes underneath the lake, uh, Lake Geneva, it's interesting. Um, but so the idea here is that, the, that you'd have this very big uh, 100 kilometer tunnel, and, you, and you'd have a new, new version of the LHC, basically. Um, and similar to the LHC, this would operate in two modes. So you'd have a, a first stage where you, you'd collide electrons instead of colliding protons. Um, and by colliding electrons, it's, it's, it's a much cleaner environment. So you, you have less noise. It's easier to process the, the images that the, that the detectors take. And so one of the major things that this electron collider would do is would study processes that look like this, where you produce a Z, and that Z can um, produce a Higgs coming from the Z. <coughs> so with, in this first stage, we, we could really study the Higgs in, in, in a lot of detail. And then there's a second stage when, when you would collide, we would collide protons in this big ring. And this we think we can get up to about 100 TeV, so 10 times more, uh, more energy than what we have now. Okay, this is a proposal that's happening at, at CERN. There's also one, interestingly, from, from China. So it's a very similar idea. Um, they would also operate in two, two modes. So they'd have an electron and a, and a proton stage. Uh, the proton stage is likely 50. 50 TeV, but you know, similar sort of levels of uh, increase with respect to the LHC. This is interesting because it could it could go on a faster time scale <coughs> if it's if it's approved. Okay, but it's really getting after the same same sorts of physics. Okay, so now I'll just end by uh, by saying what sensitivities these we might expect from these machines. Okay, so here are the sensitivities to these kappa coupling modifiers that we get by the end of the LHC running would be in this sort of in this red range. Um, these Higgs factory or these electron collider stages would get would reduce these uncertainties significantly. You would see that in these with this dark um, with this black line here. Okay, so really you know factors of 10 increases in a lot of these couplings even more for uh, 
than these other uh, modifiers. And so this would really allow us to tell if, if these if these if these processes are happening, right? So we'd be able to measure these at better than most of these at better than five sigma. So it would really be to be able to discover definitively if some of these mechanisms that protect the Higgs mass are are in place. Um, so, the, so that's really the main, this is really the main goal of the, uh, of the electron collider. The proton collider, uh, one of the things that it can do much better than the electron collider is measuring the Higgs self-coupling, so measuring pairs of Higgs bosons. Um, and so we talked about how that you could, you could um, that tells you the measurement of the Higgs potential, right, the shape of Higgs potential. So this is sort of the situation that we might be in after the LHC. So we'll only know the, the Higgs potential very locally and we, with very big uncertainties. Um, with a 100 TeV collider, the projections are that we would be able to measure that interaction to about 10%. Okay, so again, likely an order of magnitude better than we could do with the LHC. And this, we could be in this situation. We measure potential with this sort of level of detail, and we could tell between, you know, right now we have no idea if the potential really looks like the standard model, sort of in red here, or maybe it has this other another dip or some other feature that's a, that's a clear sign of it being from a composite, uh, a composite this mechanism. And this will be able to be, uh, be studied with this, this proton, proton machine. So this is one of the main physics goals for the, the higher energy proton machine. Um, another is looking for particles that could be signs of uh, extra dimensions. Okay, so we talked about how you might do that at the LHC from these pairs of Higgs bosons. Um, and what this shows is this is the, uh, at what mass scale you can exclude um, from this blue line is what we think we could do with the LHC, so maybe up to masses that are right around the TeV. Okay, so right where we expect new physics, that's sort of where our sensitivity will, will peter out. With a 100 TeV machine, you can extend this much higher. So now we can start probing uh, these models up to multi-TeV. So really starting to exclude the, the, the region where we expect new physics to be very robustly. So this is another big uh, motivation for this machine. Um, and then the other, the other one finally is also supersymmetry. Right, so here, this is the same plot that we looked at before. This is looking for super tops with this, with the mass on this axis, and these super photons um, on the other axis. We think by the, when the LHC is finished, we can exclude sort of this region. So again, sort of just starting to exclude the TEV, the, the TEV scale in terms of masses of the super tops. And what this 100 TEV machine will do is exclude all this region. So it'll exclude up to sort of eight. ATV. So again, a much more, much more robust probe of this, uh, this scale. Okay, so that's that's really where, where I'll end. Um, but the LHC, there's a really long program. We've only collected about one percent of the total, the total LHC data. Um, and really, the next five to ten years will be incredibly interesting uh, and unique time, both for increasing the precision on these these Higgs coupling measurements that could show signs of why gravity is so so weak. Um, and there's also very interesting technical challenges in coping with all these collisions and, these, and, um, and the high rate uh, of the beam crossings. Um, and, of, and as I just talked about, there's currently even bigger rings being planned that will you know, be off of this 